This is what separates the Christian identity from every false identity. The Christian identity is the only identity that is received and not achieved. You just receive it and there's nothing you can do to achieve it. I've heard it said this way, you either find your identity in Christ or your identity is in crisis. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around and see that we have an identity crisis in our world. Good morning, good morning. You can go ahead and find your seats. Anyone excited to be in God's house this morning? I hope you are. Hey, before we dive into the preaching of God's word, I wanna start by saying uh, thank you to our church because we just wrapped up four miraculous weeks of mixed camp out of Alasa Ranch. And I do not use that word lightly because what took place this summer at Alasso was a miracle. And I can't help but think about the boldness of our pastors, Ed and Lisa, in the early 2000s to have a dream and a vision, not just for a camp and retreat center out in East Texas, but a lifeline for a generation. And for the past 16 years since 2008, that is what Alasso Ranch has been. It has been a lifeline for a generation. And I think about the statistics that are coming out in regards to Gen Z, that only 4% of them have a biblical worldview. Uh, loneliness, depression, anxiety skyrocketing. Uh, it's said that it's the largest generation of people leaving the church. And at the beginning of this year, we had a conversation that as a church, we may not be able to do everything, but we can do something. And, and I wanna thank our church for doing your something. Uh, to those of you who continually invest into God's house by bringing the first fruits of what God has blessed you with, thank you. You have a stake in what took place this summer at Alasa Ranch. To those of you who make God's mission your mission by building and being a part of and serving and volunteering here at Fellowship Church, thank you. You have a stake in what God did this summer. To those of you who spent a week with some crazy kids and some crazy students out at Alasa Ranch this summer, thank you. You have a stake in what God did this summer at Alasa Ranch. And here's what I love. This summer, we're celebrating the fact that we saw the most amount of baptisms we have ever seen at Alasa Ranch. And again, I just want to say thank you. And I love that our church is not just a next generation church, it's an every generation church. And that is so important because I hope you're inspired by what God is doing within the next generation, but the next generation needs every other generation to look up to and see what faithfulness to God in his house looks like for the long haul. So again, just wanted to start and say thank you so much to our church. Would you pray with me as we get ready to dive in to the word? Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the gift of today. I thank you for the gift of these moments. I thank you for the gift of gathering together as a community of believers. Lord, I know that anytime we gather around your word is an opportunity for us to leave differently than how we first came in. And that is what I pray takes place this morning, that we would become more like you. We ask all these things in your son's name. Everybody said, amen. amen. My wife and I, We've got three kids, uh, two boys, Thunder James Kelly, he's five-year-old. Yes, that's his real name. <laughs> Our three-year-old, his name's Dodge Samuel Kelly. He's, uh, he's awesome. And then our little girl, Bowie Sunshine Kelly, she's one, and I was always warned as a dad that having a girl is different, and it is so different. Um, it's gonna be a problem because she's gonna get whatever she wants. I've already told my wife that. Uh, but but I, love, I love raising boys. There's something about the ability to raise young men that I love. And I think part of that is because it's a bit of a lost art in 2024. Uh, but I'm thankful for the ability to raise young men. And so some of the fun practical ways we do that in the Kelly household is typically before the boys go to bed, we'll have wrestling matches. And we've got three rules within our wrestling matches. The first rule is no punching. This is wrestling, not fighting. There's a difference, okay? The second rule is there's no crying because we're men. <laughs> that rule typically gets broken, but we're working on it. The third rule is very important. That's no telling mom what happened. 
That rule also tends to get broken after the second rule has been broken. <laughs> If it's not wrestling, uh, we'll typically play some dodgeball or something because I think it's a rite of passage as a young boy to understand what it's like to get hit in the face with a dodgeball. <laughs> but a couple of months ago, my oldest son, Thunder, walked into our house, makes eye contact with me, looks at me and says, hey dad, I'm the alpha. I said, excuse me, son? He said, I'm the alpha. I said, son, you can't even spell that, let alone know what it means. He goes, I know what it means, dad. I'm the strongest man in the house. I said, son, some lessons are harder to learn than others. You're about to wrestle dad. He's like, okay, okay, okay. I'm not the alpha, I'm not the alpha. But can I be the second alpha? And I'm like, okay, you can be the second alpha. And so not but a month ago, at our freedom celebration on a Saturday night where we celebrate the freedom of our nation, the freedom we have in Christ, and we celebrate with fireworks after the experience. I'm walking with the second alpha of the Kelly household, <laughs> taking them up early to go to FC Kids, and I see some students, so I start talking to the students, and out of the corner of my eye, I see him sprint off, and he just face plants on the floor, tripped over something and fell, and so I'm like, hey, just give me one second. This is gonna be a coaching moment. Like, shake it off, you're a man, everything's gonna be okay. So I go over to him and, and the cry is just a little different and uh, he turns around and he's got what looks like a third eyeball on the bridge of his nose because he hit a windowsill when he fell. And he's got a gash that is deep and it's wide. And so I'm like, well, the Kelly plans have changed tonight. We're not gonna be seeing fireworks. We're gonna be seeing a, a doctor in the emergency room. So I go and he gets bandaged up and we leave church and uh, we go to the emergency room. I think we got a photo of him sitting in my lap. What a little champ. So we, we take him back to the back room and, and you know what's bad when the doctor gasps? He's like, oh, and I'm like, you're supposed to be the calm one here. I'm freaking out internally too, okay? And so he looks at it and the doctor's like, ah, oh, I think we can glue it. That should work. And I'm like, hey, I'm not a doctor but I don't wanna come back here for a second time, so is it possible to just do stitches? Because this, this looks pretty gnarly, and he's like, okay, yeah, we can do stitches. And as soon as my son hears the word stitches, he gets quiet, which if you know my son, you know if he's quiet, something's wrong. He's the talker of the Kelly family. And, uh, and so he gets nervous because he knows stitches means needles, and you know what five-year-old is excited for that to take place. And uh, throughout the past couple months, uh, I've, Whenever I find my sons uh, feeling uh, filled with fear or, or maybe a little anxious or nervous or scared, I've asked them a certain question and I've taught them to respond in a certain way. And so I see that he's, he's worried about the stitches that he's about to get and so I ask him the question. I look at him and I say, hey bud, who are you? And because he knows the response, his eyes kind of light up and the gas gets wider and blood's dripping down his nose. I'm like, let's not do that. But he looks at me and goes, I'm Thunder James Kelly. I'm strong, I'm a man, and I'm a son of God. I wonder this morning if I were to ask you individually as you walked into church, if I asked, who are you, what your response would be? not just a regurgitation of what my five-year-old son said, but if I were to ask you, hey, what makes you you? What, what defines you? Some of you might answer, I'm um, John, I'm a dad, uh, I'm an accountant. Uh, I'm Susan, a uh, single mom, and I'm a teacher, and I'm looking for something deeper than that response. Another way it could be phrased is, have you finally figured out what separates you and the eight billion other people on this floating ball of dust we call Earth. You wanna know what I found as a pastor? I found that most people either can't answer this question or don't have a very good answer to the question. And what it tends to lead to is a life filled with insecurity and a sense of insignificance. And so what tends to take place is we start taking cues from culture to start to define us and, and, and bring ourselves and formulate an identity for ourselves. And one of the cues that we take is culture says to search with inside of yourself. And that's how you find out who you are. So look at your deepest desires, wants, and 
needs, and, and that's how you're going to find out who you are. But the book of Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful. Who can understand it? As if to say, like, your desires change every single day if you're really honest with yourself. So don't look inside of yourself. In fact, I would argue that's as silly as my five-year-old son coming up to me telling me he's the alpha of the Kelly family. Because what you're saying is, hey God, I know you created me, you made me, and you know me better than I know myself, but I'm gonna define myself outside of you. I'm just gonna look at who I think I am. No, don't make that mistake. Don't look inside of yourself, look outside of yourself, look up to God to start to define who you really are. The second cue we tend to take from culture, especially in our Western context, is we start to define ourselves and bring value to ourselves and bring identity to ourselves through our achievements. We think if we achieve more, then we actually mean more. If I achieve more things, then I'll finally start to feel value. So we start looking for the house with more square footage in the better neighborhood, buying cars that we can't afford to impress people that don't even care about us. There's, there's got to be a better way, and there is. And just to ensure, uh, first and foremost, ambition and, and wanting to achieve things is not in itself bad. But when it's the basis of your value and identity, oh, your life is going to be a roller coaster. Because here's what happens, if you don't achieve those things, you lose all your sense of value. You lose who you feel like you are. And if you do achieve them, and you're willing to be honest with yourself and with God, you would be the first to admit, satisfied for a moment, sure. Feel some level of value for a moment, sure. But moments after, you feel just as unsatisfied, if not more unsatisfied than before. Why more unsatisfied? Because you finally thought you found the thing that was gonna bring you a true sense of value in your identity, and you didn't. And just to make sure that you understand that this isn't just the preacher on the stage talking at you, when I get things twisted, you wanna know how I do it? I base it off how good my sermons are, by how many good jobs I get after I preach. And, and, and again, don't, don't mishear me, I, I wanna preach the word well. It's a role that I play, but it's not my identity. I love uh, Scotty Scheffler, he's the number one golfer in the world right now, and he won the biggest tournament this year. It's a tournament called the Masters. And he was interviewed after he won uh, with the question of identity. <laughs> The reporter essentially asked, hey, you've spoken on identity and have said that your identity isn't found in golf and just love for you to kind of unpack that. It's a little confusing because this win for you was like a, a defining moment for who you are, not only as a golfer, but really as a person and, and the history that you're gonna set and create. And Scotty goes, yeah, um, I mean, to be honest with you, I really wanted to win this tournament because I'm an extremely competitive human being. <laughs> but he goes, I was talking with my friends this morning. We were reading some scripture and I was reminded that my victory and identity was secured in what Jesus did on the cross for me. And I'm not defined by a golf score or a tournament, I'm defined by who Christ says I am. And friends, the same is true for us. This is what separates the Christian identity from every false identity, because the Christian identity is the only identity that is received and not achieved. It is the only identity that you just receive it, and there's nothing you can do to achieve it. I've heard it said this way, you either find your identity in Christ or your identity is in crisis. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around and see that we have an identity crisis in our world today. And if you don't agree with that statement, to you I would just say keep on living with your false identities and eventually it will crumble before your very eyes. Page one of the Bible, we get a snippet of our identity and who God says that we are 
and it's a, it's a concept and an idea and a passage that even I would argue those who are unfamiliar with the Christian space are aware of what this text, or at least what the idea of this text is saying. Because of that, we've become numb to the implications of it. The passage is found is in Genesis 1, verse 27, and, and I, I just want you to like actually soak this in for a moment. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. Male and female, he created them. So you and I were made in the name, image, and likeness of the star-breathing, galaxy-creating God. And I just believe if we actually understood that and let it went go from our head to our heart, it would start to change the way that we lived on a daily basis. I'm, uh, I'm kind of into fashion. I like the idea that I don't wear clothes, I wear outfits. There's a difference, okay? I don't know why you laugh that hard. But I'm going to keep preaching because I'm secure in who I am. Sometimes designer clothes make me laugh. Now hear me, I've got some designer clothes, I'm not opposed to it, um, but sometimes I just have to be honest with you, it makes me laugh because you can walk into a Gucci store and you can see a white cotton t-shirt that could and should be sold for like 10 to $20 and probably is sold the same shirt at Old Navy, but the Gucci one has a Gucci logo in the upper left-hand corner and because of that Gucci logo, it's now being sold for $575 and somebody's dumb enough to buy it. And I was laughing with this with some friends. And I had a friend go, yeah, you know, it's funny, but at the end of the day, you realize all the money's in the logo. Now think about this for a moment. You may feel like a $10 white cotton t-shirt, but the reality is you have been branded with the logo of God Almighty, which brings intrinsic value, intrinsic worth into your life. Here's the best part. You did nothing to achieve it. You just existed, and the value is already there. And when you understand that, it does two primary things. First, it changes the way that you view people, because rather than tearing people down to feel better about yourself, your goal is to instill that kind of value into other people, especially those who don't see it for themselves. Secondly, it deters you from the killer of comparison. So rather than looking around and envying what she has or what he has, and I wish I had that, and I wish I had that, and I wish I could do that, you go, you know what? If God knit me together in my mother's womb and gave me the gifts and talents and abilities that he's given me, and I'm a one-of-one one human being, I'm the handiwork of God Almighty, why would I waste my time wanting what someone else is doing when God's given me the gift of who I am. So rather than envying, I'm enjoying the creation that God has made me to be. But two chapters later in Genesis, we see that there's an enemy that comes in and sin enters the world through Adam and Eve, something called the fall. And since that moment, our identities have been marred and scarred. And the Bible reminds us that the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have seen that many times he does this by having people latch on to false identities. And so with the moments we have remaining, I simply want to walk through three enemies to your identity in Christ. Enemy number one is your feelings. Now hear me, your feelings and emotions are a gift from God. Uh, but you have to understand that your feelings don't define you. Truth does. Uh, there is what is true and there is what is false, but we're in 2024 and we got the idea that you can have your truth and I'll have mine. That's not how this works. Again, there's, there's what is true and there is what is false. So whether it's politically correct or not, there is one way to God, it is through the person of Jesus Christ, and only he has the authority, the ability to define who you are. You are not your behavior, you are not your past mistakes, you are not simply a product of your circumstances. You are who God says you are. This is why. 
This is why reading the Word of God is imperative for the Christ follower. It's not a checking off of your Christian to-do list. You are finding out first and foremost who God is. And secondly, you're finding out who you are. Because what you feel isn't always true, but what God says is always true. And the Bible reminds us that the truth is what sets you free. And I've seen people so incarcerated in their feelings. I just want to encourage them to grasp onto the truth of what God says. Second enemy to your identity in Christ is what other people say about you. I love the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, but it's the biggest lie ever. <laughs> the Bible says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. And some people are surrounded by people who are just constantly speaking death over them, and they're wondering why they're in the cir circumstance and situations that they're in. It's like, because you need to surround yourself around better people that are going to speak life into you and over you and help you become the man or woman of God that God has called you to be. But, but to me, there's another angle of this. And that angle is uh, we live in a culture and a world that is obsessed with the opinions of other people. I mean, whether you're going to admit it or not, that is a reality of our society. We are obsessed with what other people think about us. And if there was one thing I wished I could do for humanity, it would be to transfer their obsession with what other people think about them and start obsessing over what God thinks about them. You change immediately the way that you live. I want you to imagine for a moment an 18-year-old quarterback. We're in the great state of Texas. Thought this would be a good illustration. Football's around the corner. Can I get an amen? We'll keep going. 18-year-old quarterback, fresh out of high school, goes to a training camp, okay? Uh, let's say it's uh, filled with scouts. This is a big training camp, big moment for this young man. The 30 minutes into the training camp, unbeknownst to him, Tom Brady was present. Walks down from the bleachers, pulls this player off the field and says, son, I've never seen a talent like this in my life. Your football IQ, the fundamentals, your arm, at this age, I've never seen it in my life. If you continue to develop and continue to work, I believe that you could make history in the NFL. That kid goes back to the training camp. You imagine how he feels? Tom Brady said, I'm going to make history. He's throwing and training camp ends. Let's say a no-name scout comes up to him. Doesn't even know who he is, where he's from. Comes up to him and goes, son, it's just not there. You, you got to develop in these certain things. It's just, I don't know that you've got what it takes. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm that kid, I'm like, <laughs> no offense, my man, but I don't care what you say. Tom Brady said, I'm about to make history. Why? Because when it comes to football, Tom Brady's words carry more weight. Well, guess what? When it comes to life, God's words carry more weight. And sometimes I look around at Christians and people and I go, why are you living in so much insecurity? Do you not know who God says that you are? And so if you are in Christ, you have received the gift of forgiveness and turned your life over to him. Do you want to know who God says you are? This is what he says. He says, you're loved, you're a child of God, you're worthy, you're purposed, you're forgiven, you're chosen, you're protected, you're strong, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you're a new creation, you're saved, you're victorious, you're set free, you're blessed, you're never alone, you're filled with joy, and you're a citizen of heaven. So if the God who created it all says this about you, why are you so consumed with everybody else's thoughts or opinions of you? But here's what I found. <laughs> it's one thing to sit in a church service on a Sunday morning and give that a golf clap. 
It's a completely different thing to start to believe it for yourself on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It's got to go from our head to our hearts. Because again, if God says this about us, and we actually started to believe it, there would be a level of security that we all would live in that could not be taken from us. The third enemy to your identity in Christ is what you've done. Or I could say it this way for others, what's been done to you. I'd be willing to bet in a room this size that there are people who have walked through things where someone has done things to you that are so wrong and you are living in the shame of those things and you have allowed that shame and those things to define you. Others in this room, there's some stuff that you've done in your past that you are living in the shame of. You are letting those things define you. But I look to scripture in what 2 Corinthians says in chapter 5, verse 17, and I'm reminded that this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. So you no longer have to live in the shame of what's been done to you or what you have done because what you've done doesn't define you. The only thing that can define you is what Christ has done for you. And so rather than living in the shame of what you've done or the shame of what's been done to you, you realize that Jesus died on the cross and took your sin, your shame, and your pain so that you wouldn't have to live in it any longer. It's time to walk in the freedom of your identity in Christ. Back to the emergency room. Stitches haven't come yet. My son looks at me and says, hey dad, I know I'm strong, I know I'm a man, and I know I'm a son of God, but I'm still scared. I looked at him and I said, hey buddy, that's okay. Dad's gonna be here the entire time and I'm gonna make sure that you're okay. And maybe you are sitting under the sound of my voice this morning and you're like, hey, I know you say I'm purposed, I know you say I'm forgiven. I know you say I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But every time I look in the mirror, all I see are my flaws. And there's this gap between what I sense and what he says. One of my favorite attributes of God is his omnipresence, meaning he is at all places at all times. So there may be a gap between what you sense and what he said, but you can rest assured that you have a heavenly father who is with you, that will not abandon or forsake you. And here is what I have found in my journey with Jesus that as I continue to live this life with him, the gap gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And chances are, if we were to be honest with ourselves, we've all got gaps between what we sense and what he says. Can I encourage you to continue your journey with him and watch the gaps get smaller and smaller and smaller. 
So who are you? Do you know? Are you living in the freedom and the security that can only come from the one identity that is simply received? What a gift that is. You don't have to do anything but receive it. So every head bowed, every eye closed. If you have yet to receive that new identity, if you have yet to make the decision to surrender your life to Christ, to turn from your sin, and to choose to follow Jesus, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Just say this after me. You don't have to say it out loud, but just say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I need a new identity. I believe you are who you said you are. You died on a cross for my sins and three days later rose from the grave. Today I choose to follow you, choose to walk in my new identity for the rest of my life. God, I just pray a specific prayer over our church that we would be people who walk in the freedom and the security of who you say we are. That the gaps in our lives between what we sense and what you said would continue to grow smaller and smaller. We ask all these things in your son's name. Everybody said, amen. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right, and if you wanna be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your life.